Hi, James. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. So, James, tell us what you're doing in Cologne. You've been judging some of the awards. Is that right? Uh, yes. I think this is my 30th year coming to Cologne. 30th? Yeah. I'm, I love Cologne. I'm, I'm always happy to come here. And it's an amazing city. This whole hall and the design talents operation and everything is extraordinary. There's nothing like it. In, the, in this sense, it beats Milan hands down because it's much better organized. What would you say the general standard of the exhibitors, the young designers this year? Every year it gets better and better. I mean, the quality is extraordinary. They, they, they take things terribly seriously and they also seem to be very knowledgeable about what's going on in the world. I mean, a, a lot of it is obviously to do with the fact that everything's more accessible, that people can find information much quicker, including your fault. I mean, <laughs> sites like DZine and everything, everybody's aware of what's going on. And so, when you talk to them, they, they, they really know what's happening. And instead, before, they would be rather naive and, uh, and not so knowledgeable about the state of the art. Do you think, with the rise of the internet as a way of disseminating information about design, is there still a, a need for fairs like this? Uh, without any doubt, because um, I even say for the companies I work for that to have a deadline in, of an event is the most fundamental thing for developing a product. Um, if you don't have a fair to go to, they just let it drift and they never finish. I mean, there's never this kind of moment of glory. And uh, the only way to do that is have an exhibition. Let's so have a look at the images you've brought along. This is your first one. Can you tell us what's <laughs> yeah, this? this? Is, this is my studio in Milan. At, at the moment, you can just see my cleaning lady. But uh, anyway, it's a, it's a nice big open space. And this is a photograph I sent to my friend Jasper Morrison. He's got a shop in the next to his studio in, in London. And one day, um, I got a phone call in my office, and it was a, from a, there was a truck outside, and it said, we have to unload a pallet of, of buckets in your studio. Do you have a, a forklift truck? And I said, no, I don't have a forklift truck. What are these buckets? And somebody in Jasper's office had forgotten to call me to tell me that he was just delivering some plastic buckets for his shop and leaving them, parking them in my studio for, uh, until he could get, get together to pick them up. And Jasper had selected these, what were for him, the perfect Italian plastic bucket. And these buckets stayed in my studio for six months. Not like that, but I, I put them in a corner or something. And I'd asked Jasper several times to pick them up. He was a super friend of mine and everything. And then one day I just decided to, to set up this photograph and send it to Jasper saying, for God's sake, take these buckets out of my studio. And so that's this photo. The next one, what's this? This is one of my motorcycles. Um, I don't have a favorite motorcycle because they get jealous of each other. But anyway, I collect old motorcycles. This is, was, was at one time, 50 years ago, the ultimate motorcycle you could have. It's called a Triton, and it has a Triumph Bonneville engine in a Norton Dominator featherbed frame. And it's, uh, it's, the, it's the archetypal cafe racer. And I'm, I'm, I'm completely in love with these things. I'm one of these jerks who likes these kind of things. And one, I guess the main reason why is that I can look at it and I can understand it. And uh, there was a time that you could understand things, but today it's over. The computer has completely changed everything. I mean. If you look at this object, you can tell that it was made, um, you know, the, the castings were probably sculpted by hand around gears and things like that. The tubes are, are formed on bending tools and these kind of things. Today, you can envisage things in a totally plastic way so that you can have complete free form. And, but of course, with investment. And again, that's the link to industry is that you, if you want to create a, a, a chair, for, for example, for Magis or Cartel, the investment is about, uh, for a one-shot molded chair, is in the region of 500,000 euros. I mean, it's a serious deal. And so the implications are that while we have all this freedom via the computer and via programs, how you actually make it is, is, a, is a, quite a difficult thing to deal with. And you said this is one of your motorcycles. How many do you have? I've got five. There's a few biker designers, aren't there? Stark's a keen biker, I think. Tom Dixon. Yeah. Richard yeah, Tom Seymour. is always asking to borrow my bikes when he comes to Milan. Yeah. He did borrow my BSA ones. 
I was terrified. He went off, and I, oh my God, is he going to come back with it? And he did come back with a big smile on his face. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes. well, what's this then? This is the underside of a bonnet of a Fiat Tipo. It's quite beautiful. And I guess this is still connected to what I was talking about, um, about understanding something. You open the bonnet of a car, old cars. Today, they're all filled up with foam. But before, there were these kind of pressings which would uh, strengthen the sheet metal. And the, it's, not, it's not designed by a designer. It's designed by an engineer, but it has a superb language to it. And I chose this one to, to make a research for a project for a table. And my idea was that um, you could have a flat sheet of metal, and then with this type of structure underneath, the, the table would look completely thin. I mean, Jean Nouvel did that for Unifor and things like that. And then I, so I started designing it, and then I looked at it, and I realized that all the beauty was underneath, and nobody would ever, just see a sheet of metal. So there was absolutely, it was a, I dropped the project immediately because it had no, no sense to it at all. So t talk us through this picture. <laughs> uh, how many of you have been to Japan? Uh, you've got to go to Japan, mainly for this. And this is yakitori, which is cooked sticks. And those things on the, on the left there, these green things are called edamame, which are little soya beans that you pop in their own little packaging and they go in your mouth. Um, my relationship with Japan, I, I lived there in 1987 for a year. I was working for Toshiba. And uh, I can actually be in Milan sitting at my desk, and it's about lunchtime. And I get a, a, a heavy craving to eat this, which is like Japanese fast food. And when I get to Tokyo, you go to even the most the, the looks terrible kind of yakitori bar. It was dirty, seedy with cockroaches running around. But it is exquisitely delicious. So for you, this is about the food, not about the design, the presentation, or is it both? It's the kind of it's the kind of casual not worrying about it kind of thing. I mean, like letting things be, um, there's something so natural about the whole, the whole eating process in this way. And uh, uh, the extraordinary thing about Japanese culture is it goes from being mind-blowingly refined, almost too much, to being wonderfully natural and easy, you know? I mean, the Japanese basically are pretty chilled out people when they relax. They have a better time than we do, I tell you. I guess I can tell you this is a, uh, um, I, I work as a consultant for Muji in Japan and every f sort of few weeks they send an email saying do something like this and, and one of these emails was for t-shirts and the problem with Muji is that you can't do a t-shirt with I don't know a, a picture on it or something because Muji is not about that at all so I tried to say well what could be a Muji useful t-shirt I was thinking about this and I went on the internet and I thought about when I lived in Tokyo every day going on the subway and you would be packed into the subway all like this next to people. And I was thinking about the problem of deodorant and uh, people smelling, especially guys, they smell quite a lot. Um, and uh, this is the way I presented the project to Muji as a film of, of slides. And basically what I did was I, this is my assistant Madalena, who works for me, she's wonderful. So I took a normal white t-shirt and uh, take the picture of Madalena complaining that my armpit smells. And then I show her that I've got these little special tablets from Muji, which are like, this is the invention, so to speak, like a super heavy dose of deodorant, which you could never apply with a roll-on or a spray. So the thing is like, I don't know, two millimeters thick of anti-stink or whatever. And I'm saying to Madalena here, thumbs up. Thank God I've got my T-shirt. Uh, smelly this and there and the inside of the t-shirt is a little pocket so you pop this stuff into the pocket there you are and put it on and then my assistant Madalena is happy anyway they didn't do it <laughs> we have to move on quick to our next okay, people James Irvin thank you so much for coming along Big thank you very much